My name is Elijah Clearwater, and this happened to me in 2018. I grew up in the heart of Montana, on a small reservation where everyone knew everyone else's business. We were tight-knit, and our sense of community was as vast as the land that stretched for miles around us. After high school, I moved to Bozeman for college and ended up staying there, working as a wildlife biologist. It wasn't glamorous, but I loved the work. One summer, I decided to spend a few weeks back home. My cousin, Tyrone, had just bought an old hunting cabin deep in the Gallatin National Forest, and he invited me to join him for a few days to help fix the place up. It was supposed to be a break from the monotony of city life and a chance to reconnect with the wilderness. The cabin was isolated, a good two-hour drive from the nearest town. We stocked up on supplies, loaded up Tyrone's truck, and headed out. The drive was uneventful, just a lot of winding roads through dense forest. We arrived in the late afternoon, the sun casting long shadows through the trees. The cabin itself was nothing special, a one-room structure with a small porch and an outhouse a few yards away. It had been abandoned for years, and it showed. The roof sagged, and the windows were grimy with dirt and age, but it had a certain charm, a promise of adventures and stories yet to be told. We spent the first couple of days cleaning and making minor repairs. There was no electricity, so we used lanterns and a wood stove for cooking. It felt like stepping back in time, and I enjoyed the simplicity of it. We worked hard during the day and spent the evenings on the porch, talking and drinking beer, the forest around us alive with the sounds of nature. On the third night, things took a turn. We had just finished dinner and were sitting on the porch when we heard something unusual, a distant scream that echoed through the trees. It was faint, almost like the wind, but it had an eerie, human quality to it. Tyrone and I looked at each other, unease settling in. Did you hear that? he asked. Yeah, I replied, trying to sound casual. Probably just an animal. We tried to brush it off, but the sound lingered in the back of our minds. The next day, we decided to explore the area around the cabin. We hiked through the dense underbrush, following deer trails and old logging roads. The forest was thick, and it was easy to get turned around if you weren't paying attention. Around midday, we stumbled upon an old campsite. It looked like it hadn't been used in years. Rusted cans, a collapsed tent, and the remnants of a fire pit. There was something unsettling about it, but we didn't dwell on it. People came and went through these woods all the time, and it wasn't unusual to find traces of their presence. As we made our way back to the cabin, I noticed something odd. There were markings on the trees, deep scratches that didn't look like they were made by any animal I knew of. They were too high up and too deliberate, almost like someone had carved them there. I pointed them out to Tyrone, and he shrugged. Probably some kids messing around, he said, but I wasn't so sure. The marks were old, weathered, but there was a pattern to them, a sense of purpose that didn't fit with the idea of a prank. That night, the screams returned, louder and closer this time. They came in bursts, each one more desperate than the last. Tyrone and I stood on the porch, straining to hear our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The forest was eerily silent between the screams, as if it was holding its breath. We should check it out, Tyrone said, his voice tight. I hesitated. What if it's a trap? Then we'll deal with it, he replied, grabbing his rifle. We can't just ignore it. I nodded, grabbing a flashlight and a hunting knife. We followed the sound into the woods, our footsteps muffled by the underbrush. The screams led us deeper and deeper, until the cabin was just a distant memory. My heart pounded in my chest, and every snap of a twig made me jump. After what felt like hours, we came to a clearing. In the center, illuminated by the moonlight, was a man. He was disheveled, his clothes torn and dirty, and he was muttering to himself, rocking back and forth. We approached cautiously, our flashlights trained on him. Hey, are you okay? Tyrone called out. The man looked up, his eyes wide with fear. 
They're coming, he whispered. They're coming for me. Who's coming? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. They took my friends, he said, his voice trembling. They're in the trees, watching, waiting. Tyrone and I exchanged a glance, the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. We needed to get out of there, and fast. Tyrone stepped forward, reaching out a hand to the man. Come with us, he said. We'll get you to safety. The man shook his head. It's too late. They've marked me. Before we could respond, there was a rustling in the trees. I turned, my flashlight catching movement, a figure, tall and gaunt, with elongated limbs and eyes that glowed in the darkness. It moved with an unnatural grace, almost gliding over the ground. Run, I shouted, grabbing Tyrone's arm. We sprinted back through the woods, the man's screams echoing behind us. I didn't dare look back, fear propelling me forward. The forest seemed to close in around us, branches clawing at our clothes and faces. We burst into the clearing where the cabin stood, slamming the door shut behind us. What the hell was that? Tyrone gasped, his face pale. I don't know, I said, my mind racing. But we need to leave. Now. We gathered our things in a frenzy, throwing them into the truck. As we drove away, I glanced back at the cabin. In the distance, I saw the figure standing at the edge of the forest, watching us. I shuddered, turning my attention back to the road. We didn't stop until we reached Bozeman, our nerves frayed and our minds racing. We reported what happened to the local authorities, but they were skeptical, chalking it up to our imaginations and the isolation of the forest. But I knew what I saw, and so did Tyrone. A few days later, we heard about a missing hiker in the area where we had been. The search party found his campsite, but no trace of the man himself. The news sent a chill down my spine, a stark reminder of how close we had come to disappearing ourselves. Tyrone and I never went back to that cabin. We tried to put the experience behind us, but it lingered, a dark shadow over our memories. We would talk about it sometimes, late at night over a few beers trying to make sense of it all. But there were no answers, only questions. Years passed, and life went on. I moved to a different city, started a family, and tried to forget about that summer. But every now and then, I would hear a scream in the distance, or see a shadow out of the corner of my eye, and the memories would come flooding back. I still don't know what we encountered in those woods. Maybe it was some unknown creature or perhaps it was something more sinister. All I know is that it was real, and it changed me in ways I can't fully explain. Sometimes, I wonder if there are others out there who have had similar experiences, people who have seen the same things and felt the same fear. I hope they have found their way back and that they are safe, because whatever it was, it's still out there waiting, and I can only hope it never finds me again. My name is Alon Calloway, and this happened to me in 1996. I grew up on the fringes of a small town called Bainberry, tucked away in the dense forests of Montana. It wasn't much, but it was home. I was 27 then, working odd jobs to get by. One of those gigs involved maintaining the trails in the national forest nearby, a job I shared with my best friend, Rory Dumont. We were close, Rory and I. He was like a brother to me and we spent countless hours hiking, fishing, and just talking about life. That summer, there had been rumors of strange happenings in the woods. Folks in town whispered about disappearances, but we didn't pay much attention. We were young, and like most young men, we thought we were invincible. One day, Rory suggested we camp out at Blackwater Creek, a spot deep in the forest that we'd both heard about but never visited. We can fish, drink some beers, and maybe figure out what's spooking everyone, he said with a grin. I agreed. It sounded like a good time, and honestly, I was curious too. We packed our gear and headed out early one Saturday morning. The hike was long, but the weather was perfect, and the scenery was breathtaking. 
The deeper we went, the quieter it became. By mid-afternoon, we reached Blackwater Creek. It was beautiful, almost untouched. We set up our tent, started a fire, and settled in for the night. After a few hours of fishing and a couple of beers, Rory started talking about the disappearances. You think there's any truth to those stories? He asked, poking at the fire with a stick. I mean people just vanishing without a trace. It's kind of creepy. Probably just folks getting lost, I replied. This place is huge. Easy to get turned around if you don't know where you're going. Yeah, maybe, Rory said, but he didn't seem convinced. As the night wore on, we heard something strange. It was a distant low sound, almost like a hum, but not quite. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. You hear that? I asked Rory. Yeah, he said, looking around. Probably just the wind. But it didn't sound like the wind. It had an unnatural quality to it, something that made me uneasy. We decided to call it a night and retreated to our tent. I must have fallen asleep quickly because the next thing I remember is waking up to a rustling sound outside. I nudged Rory. You hear that? I whispered. Yeah, he replied, his voice tense. Stay here. I'll check it out. Rory grabbed his flashlight and unzipped the tent. He stepped outside, and I followed, despite his protests. The rustling continued, coming from the direction of the creek. We moved cautiously, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. That's when we saw it. At first, it looked like a man. But as we got closer, it became clear that this was no ordinary person. It was tall, too tall, with limbs that seemed too long and thin. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and its eyes, they were like nothing I'd ever seen, black and empty, devoid of any emotion or life. Rory, we need to go, I whispered urgently, but before we could move it turned and looked straight at us. Rory froze, and I felt a chill run through me. Then it started moving toward us, silently, almost gliding. We backed away, but it was fast, too fast. Rory stumbled, and the thing was on him in an instant. I watched in horror as it grabbed him, its fingers like claws digging into his flesh. Rory screamed, and I ran. I ran as fast as I could, not looking back. I heard Rory's screams echo through the trees, and then there was silence. I didn't stop running until I reached the edge of the forest, near the ranger station. I burst inside, gasping for breath, trying to explain what had happened. The rangers looked at me like I was crazy, but they organized a search party. They found nothing. No sign of Rory, no trace of the creature. Just our campsite, our gear and blood. Lots of blood. For weeks I was questioned by the authorities, but they never found anything. Rory was declared missing, presumed dead. People in town started looking at me differently, whispering behind my back. Some thought I had something to do with his disappearance, but most just avoided me. I couldn't blame them. I was different after that night. I stopped working in the forest, moved away from Bainbury. Tried to start fresh in a new town, but the memories followed me. I couldn't escape what I'd seen, what had happened to Rory. Nights were the worst, filled with nightmares of that creature and Rory's screams. Years passed, but I never forgot. I couldn't. Occasionally, I'd hear about another disappearance in the forest, and I knew. I knew it was still out there, whatever it was. One night, I was having a drink at a bar in a small town in Oregon when a man sat next to me. He introduced himself as Tom. He was older, maybe in his late fifties, with a weathered face that spoke of a life spent outdoors. We got to talking, and I mentioned Bainberry. His eyes widened. Bainberry, huh? You ever hear about the old tales from the natives around there? I shook my head. No, not really. What kind of tales? He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. There's a legend about a creature, something that's been around long before the settlers came. They call it the Wendigo. It's said to be a spirit that possesses humans, turning them into cannibalistic beings. But sometimes, the spirit takes physical form. A chill ran down my spine. 
You think that's what I saw? Tom shrugged. Could be. Some folks believe the Wendigo is more than just a spirit. It's a curse. A manifestation of the darkest parts of the human soul. It preys on those who are lost, both physically and spiritually. I didn't know what to say. It sounded like something out of a horror story, but after what I'd seen, I couldn't dismiss it. Tom looked at me, his eyes serious. Whatever you saw, whatever happened to your friend, it's part of that forest now. Best to leave it be. I nodded, but I knew I couldn't. Not entirely. Rory was still out there, and so was that thing. I'd moved on, but a part of me was still stuck in those woods, haunted by what I'd seen and the friend I'd lost. Years later, I decided to return to Bainbury. I needed closure, needed to face whatever it was that had taken Rory. I contacted an old friend, Marcus, who still lived in town. He agreed to come with me, though I could tell he was skeptical. We headed back to Blackwater Creek, the place unchanged by time. The memories came flooding back, but I pushed them aside. We set up camp, much like Rory and I had done all those years ago. That night, as the fire crackled, Marcus and I talked about the past. He'd heard the stories, too, about the Wendigo and the disappearances. You really think there's something out here? He asked, his voice barely a whisper. I don't know, I admitted, but I need to find out. As the night wore on, we heard that same strange hum. My heart raced, but I forced myself to stay calm. Marcus looked at me, his eyes wide. What is that? I don't know, but stay close. We grabbed our flashlights and ventured into the darkness. The hum grew louder and then we saw it. The same pale, thin figure, its black eyes staring at us. It's real, Marcus whispered, his voice trembling. I nodded. Stay behind me. The creature moved towards us, and I raised my flashlight trying to keep it at bay. But it was fast, too fast. It lunged at Marcus, and I reacted without thinking. I grabbed the knife from my belt and plunged it into the creature's side. It let out a sound, not a scream, but a high-pitched whine and recoiled. I pulled Marcus to his feet and we ran. We didn't stop until we reached the ranger station. This time, I wasn't alone. Marcus had seen it too, and his testimony helped. The authorities organized another search, but like before, they found nothing. Marcus and I left Bainbury for good after that. I couldn't stay, not with the memories and the fear that it would come back. I settled in a small town in Oregon, where I met my wife and started a family. Life moved on, but the past never fully let go. I still think about Rory, about what happened in those woods. Sometimes I dream about it, the creature's black eyes staring at me, accusing me of running, of leaving Rory behind. But I know there was nothing I could do. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't human, and it wasn't something you could fight with a knife or a gun. Years later, when my son was old enough to understand, I told him the story. He listened, wide-eyed, and asked, Do you think it's still out there? I looked at him, and for a moment I saw a flicker of Rory in his eyes. I don't know, I said honestly, but if it is, I hope it stays in those woods where it belongs. And that's my story, a tale of a friend lost to something unimaginable, a creature that defies explanation. I don't know if it was the Wendigo or something else, but I know it was real. And I know I'll never forget. My name is Cody Kachina, and this happened to me in 1997. I grew up on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona, surrounded by vast deserts and rocky mesas. Life was simple and mostly quiet, but not without its share of hardships. After high school, I left the reservation to work as a mechanic in Phoenix. It wasn't a glamorous job, but it paid the bills and kept me busy. One weekend, my buddy Ellis Begay called me up. Ellis and I grew up together, and we shared a love for the outdoors. He invited me to a camping trip in the Superstition Mountains, a place we'd often explored as kids. We hadn't seen each other in years and I figured it would be a good chance to catch up. Bring your old hunting rifle, Cody, 
Ellis said over the phone. Might do a little shooting if we get the chance. I wasn't big on hunting, but the rifle had been my grandfather's, and it brought back memories of him teaching me how to shoot. So I packed it up, along with some camping gear, and headed out to meet Ellis. The Superstition Mountains were as beautiful and imposing as I remembered. Red rock cliffs towered over us, casting long shadows in the late afternoon sun. Ellis and I set up camp near a small creek. We spent the evening reminiscing about old times, roasting marshmallows over the fire and staring up at the stars. It was a clear night, and the sky was a canvas of shimmering lights. The next morning, we decided to hike deeper into the mountains. There was a spot Ellis wanted to show me, a hidden cave he'd discovered a few months earlier. As we trekked through the rugged terrain, I felt a sense of nostalgia mixed with unease. The mountains were familiar, yet they held an air of mystery that I couldn't shake. After a few hours of hiking, we reached the cave. It was hidden behind a dense thicket of shrubs and trees, almost invisible unless you knew where to look. We squeezed through the narrow entrance and found ourselves in a large, dimly lit chamber. The air inside was cool and damp, and the sound of dripping water echoed off the walls. Ellis lit a lantern, and we explored the cave. The walls were covered in ancient petroglyphs, depicting scenes of hunting, dancing, and what looked like rituals. It was fascinating, but something about the place felt off. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was a heaviness in the air, like the cave was holding its breath. As we ventured deeper, we found a smaller chamber off to the side. Inside, there were more carvings, but these were different. They depicted figures that were twisted and distorted, almost monstrous. Ellis and I exchanged uneasy glances. Neither of us spoke, but we both felt it. The cave was a place of power, and not all of it was good. We decided to head back to camp, but as we made our way out, Ellis noticed something glinting in the dirt. He picked it up and showed it to me. It was a small, intricately carved stone, unlike anything I'd seen before. Ellis pocketed it, and we left the cave. Back at camp, we tried to shake off the unease. We cooked dinner, cracked open a couple of beers and talked about the cave. Ellis was fascinated by the stone and the carvings, but I couldn't get the images out of my head. There was something about those twisted figures that bothered me. That night, I had trouble sleeping. The sounds of the desert seemed louder, more insistent. Around midnight, I heard something moving outside the tent. I figured it was just a coyote, or maybe a javelina, but the sound was different, more deliberate. I grabbed my flashlight and the rifle and stepped outside. The moon was high, casting long shadows across the campsite. I scanned the area with the flashlight but saw nothing. The sound had stopped and everything was eerily quiet. I shook my head, chalking it up to my imagination, and went back to the tent. The next morning, Ellis was already up making coffee. He looked tired, like he hadn't slept much either. We didn't talk about the noises from the night before, but I could tell he was on edge too. We decided to cut the trip short and head back to Phoenix. As we were packing up, Ellis couldn't find the stone he'd picked up in the cave. He swore he'd put it in his backpack, but it was gone. We searched the campsite, but found nothing. Ellis was frustrated, but I was relieved. Something about that stone felt wrong, and I was glad it was gone. We hiked back to the trailhead in silence. The mountains, once a place of adventure and discovery, now felt ominous. I was eager to get back to the city away from whatever had unsettled us. A few days after we got back, Ellis called me. He sounded shaken. He told me that he'd been having strange dreams since the trip, dreams of the cave and the twisted figures. Worse, he said he'd been seeing things, shadowy figures out of the corner of his eye, whispers in the dark. I told him to get some rest, maybe see a doctor, but he insisted something was following him. A week later, Ellis went missing. His apartment was left in disarray with no signs of forced entry. The police found his phone and wallet on the kitchen table, but there was no trace of him. I was questioned, of course, but I had no answers. 
All I could think about was the cave and the stone. The days turned into weeks, and Ellis was still missing. I started having the dreams, too. Visions of the cave, the twisted figures, and the feeling of being watched. I tried to push it out of my mind, but the sense of dread grew stronger each day. One night, I decided to go back to the Superstition Mountains. I needed answers, and the cave seemed like the only place to find them. I packed my gear and drove out to the trailhead, arriving just before sunset. The mountains loomed in the fading light, their shadows long and menacing. I hiked to the cave with a sense of urgency, driven by a need to understand what had happened to Ellis. The entrance was just as we'd left it, hidden behind the thicket. I squeezed through and made my way to the chamber with the carvings. The air inside was still and heavy. I lit a lantern and examined the carvings again. The twisted figures seemed to writhe in the flickering light, their eyes following me. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I pressed on, determined to find some clue. In the smaller chamber, I found something new. The carvings had changed. Where before there had been monstrous figures, there were now scenes of violence and chaos, figures fighting, fleeing and falling. At the center of it all was a dark, formless shape, surrounded by the twisted figures. As I stared at the carvings, I heard a sound behind me. It was a low, guttural noise, unlike anything I'd ever heard. I turned slowly, my heart pounding in my chest. In the dim light of the lantern, I saw a figure standing at the entrance to the chamber. It was tall and thin, its skin a sickly gray. Its eyes were hollow, and its mouth was a gaping maw. It moved slowly toward me, and I felt a wave of terror wash over me. I raised the rifle, but my hands were shaking so badly I could barely aim. The creature stopped a few feet away, its hollow eyes fixed on me. It reached out with a long, bony arm, and I fired. The shot echoed through the cave, and the creature let out a deafening shriek. It staggered back, clutching its chest, and then collapsed to the ground. I didn't wait to see if it was dead. I turned and ran, scrambling out of the cave and into the night. I didn't stop running until I reached my truck. I drove back to Phoenix in a daze, my mind racing with what I'd seen. When I got home... I called the police and told them everything. They didn't believe me, of course. They chalked it up to stress and trauma, but I knew what I'd seen. Ellis was gone, and that creature had something to do with it. I never went back to the Superstition Mountains. The nightmares continued, but I learned to live with them. Ellis was never found, and his disappearance remains a mystery. I can't explain what happened in that cave, but I know it was real. Years later, I heard stories from other people who had hiked in the Superstition Mountains. Stories of strange sightings, eerie noises, and disappearances. The mountains held secrets and not all of them were meant to be uncovered. I still think about Ellis in the cave, and I wonder what would have happened if we'd never found it. Maybe it's better not to know. Some places are meant to remain hidden, their secrets buried in the shadows. All I know is that I'll never forget what I saw, and I'll never set foot in those mountains again. My name is Kieran Watley, and this happened to me in 1983. I'm a Native American man from the Blackfeet tribe, born and raised in a small town in Montana. I've always loved the outdoors, hunting, fishing, and camping. That's how I ended up in this mess, really. I decided to spend a weekend in the Crazy Mountains, an area not far from my hometown. The place had always intrigued me with its rugged terrain and sparse population. I packed my old Chevy truck with camping gear and a few essentials. My friend Tim Larson decided to join me. Tim's a good guy, a bit reckless at times, but loyal to the bone. We'd known each other since grade school, He's the kind of guy who'd give you the shirt off his back without asking why you needed it. We planned a weekend of hiking and fishing, just getting away from it all. We left on a Friday morning, early enough to see the mist still hanging over the fields. The drive to the mountains was uneventful, 
just a couple of guys talking about nothing and everything. We reached the base of the mountains by noon. The place was beautiful, the kind of beauty that makes you forget everything bad in your life. We set up camp by a small lake, the water clear and cold. Tim and I spent the first day fishing. The fish were biting, and we managed to catch a few good-sized trout. That night, we cooked our catch over an open fire, the scent of the roasting fish mingling with the pine and fresh air. We talked about old times, laughed about high school pranks, and planned our hike for the next day. The next morning, we packed light and set off into the mountains. The trail was narrow and winding, with steep drops and dense forest on either side. Tim was ahead of me, chatting away about some girl he met at a bar last week. I was half listening, more focused on the path ahead and the sounds of the forest. We hiked for hours, the sun climbing high in the sky and then beginning its descent. Around late afternoon, we stumbled upon something strange. It was a clearing, but not a natural one. The trees around it had been cut down and the ground was bare. In the center stood a crude stone structure almost like an altar. It gave me the creeps, but Tim, being Tim, walked right up to it. Hey, Kieran, check this out, he called. I walked over, and that's when I saw it. On the stone was a symbol, carved deep into the surface. It looked like some kind of creature, humanoid but not quite. Its limbs were too long, its eyes too large. I felt a chill, but I shrugged it off. Just some old native stuff, I said, trying to sound casual. Probably a ceremonial site or something. Tim nodded, but I could tell he was curious. You ever seen anything like this before? Maybe in books, I replied, but not out here. We left the clearing and continued our hike, but something had changed. The forest seemed quieter, the shadows longer. By the time we decided to head back, the sun was setting and the temperature was dropping. We picked up our pace, not wanting to be caught in the dark. As we walked, I kept thinking about that stone structure. There was something off about it. I didn't mention my unease to Tim, though. No need to spook him over something that was probably nothing. It was almost dark when we reached our campsite. We built a fire, larger than the previous night, and cooked the rest of our food. Tim was unusually quiet, staring into the flames. I was about to ask him what was wrong when we heard it. A rustling sound, faint but distinct, coming from the direction of the lake. Probably just an animal, I said, more to reassure myself than Tim. Yeah. Probably, he replied, not looking convinced. We sat there listening, but the sound didn't come again. Eventually we turned in, but I couldn't sleep. I lay there, staring at the ceiling of my tent, my mind racing. I must have dozed off at some point because the next thing I knew, Tim was shaking me awake. Kieran, wake up! I sat up groggy and disoriented. What's going on? Something's outside, Tim whispered. I listened and sure enough, there it was. A soft, scraping sound, like something was moving around our campsite. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent. The night was pitch black, the fire reduced to glowing embers. I shone the light around but saw nothing. Probably just a raccoon, I said, though I didn't believe it. Tim nodded, but neither of us went back to sleep. We sat by the dying fire, watching and listening. The sounds continued, moving around us never coming closer but never going away. It was unnerving, to say the least. By dawn, the sounds had stopped. We packed up our gear and decided to head back to town. The unease from the night before lingered and we were both on edge. As we made our way down the mountain, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. Halfway down, we saw it. At first, I thought it was a person, but as it stepped out from behind a tree, I realized it was something else. It was tall, maybe seven feet, with long limbs and pale, almost translucent skin. Its eyes were large and black, and its mouth, it was too wide, filled with sharp, pointed teeth. Tim froze, his face going pale. I felt a surge of adrenaline and did the only thing I could think of. I grabbed a large stick from the ground and held it out in front of me. Stay back, I shouted though my voice trembled. 
the creature tilted its head as if curious. Then it moved. Fast. Before I could react, it was on Tim, its long fingers wrapped around his neck. Tim's scream was cut short as the creature lifted him off the ground and threw him against a tree. The sound of his body hitting the trunk was sickening. I charged at the creature, swinging the stick with all my might. It turned towards me, its eyes locking onto mine. I hit it, but it was like hitting a stone wall. The creature barely flinched. It reached out and grabbed me by the arm, its grip like a vice. I struggled, kicking and hitting, but it was no use. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it released me. I fell to the ground, gasping for air. The creature looked down at me, its expression unreadable. Then it turned and disappeared into the forest. I crawled over to Tim. He was unconscious but breathing. His neck was bruised, but he was alive. I lifted him onto my shoulders and began the long trek back to the truck. Every step was agony, but I couldn't stop. Not with that thing still out there. It was late afternoon by the time we reached the truck. I laid Tim in the back seat and drove like a madman to the nearest town. I didn't stop until we reached the hospital. Tim was taken in, and I was left in the waiting room, covered in dirt and blood, my mind racing. The doctor said Tim would be okay. He had a concussion and a few broken ribs, but he would recover. They asked what happened, but I didn't know what to tell them. Who would believe me? A couple of days later, I went back to the mountains with a group of friends. We were armed this time, determined to find whatever attacked us. We searched for hours, but found nothing. No tracks, no signs of a struggle, nothing. It was like the creature had vanished into thin air. Tim recovered, but he was never the same. He refused to talk about what happened, and eventually we drifted apart. I can't blame him. I haven't been able to get the image of that creature out of my head. I still go out into the mountains, but I'm more cautious now. I carry a gun, and I never go alone. I don't know what that thing was. Some kind of unknown animal, a cryptid maybe. I've heard stories from the old folks in my tribe about creatures that live in the deep forests. Things that aren't supposed to exist. They call it Wendigo. A name that sends chills down my spine even now. I don't know if that's what we saw, but I do know one thing. I'll never forget that day in the crazy mountains. It changed me, made me more aware of the things that lurk just beyond the edge of our understanding. There's a lot out there that we don't know, and some things we're better off not finding out. My name is Tahoma Redbird, and this happened to me in 1994. Back then, I was just a regular guy living in a small town in Northern California, trying to make ends meet. I worked as a mechanic at a local garage, spent my weekends fishing, and occasionally went out for a drink with friends. Life was simple, and I liked it that way. One Friday evening, my buddy Marcus and I decided to head out to the old logging road for a bit of off-roading. It was our usual spot tucked away in the dense forest where we could let loose without bothering anyone. Marcus was a big guy with a loud laugh and a heart of gold. He'd been my best friend since we were kids, and we always had each other's backs. We loaded up his beat-up jeep with some snacks, a couple of beers, and our fishing gear. The plan was to drive out to a secluded lake we'd found a few years back, do some fishing and camp out under the stars. We left town just as the sun was setting, casting a warm orange glow over the trees. The drive was uneventful, with Marcus cracking jokes and the two of us reminiscing about old times. The road got rougher as we went deeper into the forest, the trees closing in around us. It was peaceful in a way, just the sound of the jeep's engine and the occasional rustle of wildlife. We reached the lake just as it was getting dark. The water was still, reflecting the moonlight like a mirror. We set up camp quickly, eager to start fishing. Marcus built a small fire while I got our rods ready. It was perfect, the kind of night that makes you appreciate the simple things in life. A couple of hours passed, and we'd only caught a few small fish. We didn't mind, though. 
It was more about being out there, away from the noise and stress of everyday life. We were talking about heading back to the fire when we heard something strange, a rustling in the bushes behind us. Probably just a deer, Marcus said, shrugging it off. But the noise persisted, getting closer and more deliberate. We both turned, peering into the darkness, but couldn't see anything. Who's there? Marcus called out, his voice steady but cautious. No response, just more rustling. We exchanged a look, both of us on edge now. Maybe it's a bear, I suggested, though I wasn't convinced. We'd seen bears in the area before, but this felt different, more intentional. We grabbed our flashlights and shone them into the trees. The beams cut through the darkness, but all we saw were leaves and shadows. Then, just as we were about to turn back, we saw it, a figure, standing just beyond the tree line. It was tall and thin, with long arms and legs that seemed too lanky for its body. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and its eyes, I swear they glowed in the light. We froze, staring at this thing, trying to make sense of what we were seeing. What the hell is that? Marcus whispered, his voice barely audible. I don't know, I replied, my heart pounding. Let's get out of here. We backed away slowly, not taking our eyes off the figure. It didn't move, just stood there, watching us. We reached the jeep and climbed in, slamming the doors shut. Marcus fumbled with the keys, finally getting the engine to start. We sped away, leaving the campsite and the eerie figure behind. Neither of us spoke for a while, the tension in the jeep thick enough to cut with a knife. Finally, Marcus broke the silence. Do you think it was some kind of prank, like kids messing around? I don't know, man, I said, shaking my head. It didn't look human. We didn't go back to the logging road for a while after that. Life returned to normal, or as normal as it could be after seeing something like that. We told a few friends about it, but they just laughed it off, saying we must have been seeing things or that it was a trick of the light. A few months passed, and we tried to put the whole thing behind us. But then, strange things started happening around town. People began to go missing. First, it was a couple of hikers who never returned from a weekend trip. Then, a local teenager disappeared on his way home from a party. The town was on edge, and rumors started flying. One evening, Marcus and I were having a drink at the local bar when old man Harlan came in, looking pale and shaken. He was a retired logger, tough as nails and not easily spooked. He sat down next to us, ordered a whiskey, and downed it in one go. You boys heard about the disappearances, right? He asked, his voice low. Yeah, Marcus replied. Everyone's talking about it. What do you think's going on? Harlan leaned in, glancing around to make sure no one else was listening. I saw something out there, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Out in the woods. It was... not human. Marcus and I exchanged a look. What did you see? I asked my heart starting to race. Harlan described the same figure we'd seen, tall, pale, and with glowing eyes. He'd encountered it while out on a walk, and it had followed him for a while before disappearing into the trees. I don't know what it is, he said, but it's dangerous, and I think it's behind the disappearances. We left the bar that night with a sense of dread hanging over us. Whatever that thing was, it was real, and it was out there, hunting people. We decided to go back to the logging road to see if we could find any clues. The next morning, we geared up and headed out, taking Marcus's jeep again. The drive was silent, both of us lost in our thoughts. When we reached the lake, we parked and started searching the area. It was eerie being back, the memory of that night still fresh in our minds. We didn't find anything unusual at first, just the remnants of our old campsite. But then Marcus called out, Hey, Tahoma, come look at this. I walked over to where he was standing and saw what he was pointing at. Footprints, large and humanoid, but with long, claw-like toes. They led away from the lake, deeper into the forest. We followed the tracks, our nerves on edge. The forest was dense, the trees blocking out most of the sunlight. We moved slowly, trying to stay quiet. 
The tracks led us to a clearing, and that's when we saw it. There was a makeshift shelter built from branches and leaves. Inside, we found scraps of clothing, torn and stained with blood. There was also a small pile of bones picked clean. Jesus, Marcus muttered. What the hell is this? Before I could respond, we heard a noise behind us, the same rustling we'd heard that night by the lake. We turned, and there it was, standing at the edge of the clearing, watching us. It moved this time, stepping forward with slow, deliberate steps. We backed away, but it was too late. The thing lunged at us faster than anything I'd ever seen. Marcus tried to fend it off, but it overpowered him, its claws tearing into his flesh. I grabbed a fallen branch and swung it at the creature, hitting it in the head. It staggered back, giving me a chance to pull Marcus away. We ran, not looking back, the sound of the creature's footsteps close behind. We made it back to the jeep, Marcus bleeding heavily. I drove as fast as I could, my heart pounding in my chest. We reached the hospital, and I got Marcus inside, yelling for help. They took him into surgery, but I could see the fear in the doctor's eyes. They didn't know if he would make it. I waited for hours, pacing the hallway, my mind racing. Finally, a nurse came out and told me Marcus was stable but critical. I sat by his bedside holding his hand, praying he'd pull through. Days turned into weeks, and Marcus slowly recovered. He had deep scars, both physical and emotional, but he was alive. We told the authorities what happened, but they didn't believe us. They thought we were crazy, that we'd made it all up. The disappearances continued, and the town remained on edge. Marcus and I knew the truth, though, and we warned everyone we could to stay out of the forest. I moved away eventually, unable to shake the memories of that night. I still think about it, about the thing we saw and the people who went missing. I wonder if it's still out there, waiting for its next victim. But one thing I know for sure, I'll never go back to those woods again. That experience changed me. It made me realize how fragile life is and how quickly things can go from normal to terrifying. I still work as a mechanic, but I keep to myself more now. I've become more cautious more aware of my surroundings. I don't take anything for granted anymore. Sometimes I dream about that night, the creature's glowing eyes haunting my sleep. I wake up in a cold sweat, my heart racing, and it takes me a while to calm down. I've talked to a few therapists about it, but it's hard to explain something so surreal, so horrifying. Most people don't understand, and I can't blame them. Marcus and I stay in touch, though we don't talk about what happened much. It's like an unspoken agreement between us. We survived and that's all that matters. We've both tried to move on, but some things you just can't forget. My name is Tom Matthias, and this happened to me back in 1983. I was a young guy, living in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. I worked as a mechanic in a small shop off Route 66, fixing up old cars and occasionally a tractor or two. My life was simple and I liked it that way. I wasn't one for big cities or crowded places. I liked the quiet, the sense of space. One summer night, I got a call from my buddy, Clint. Clint and I grew up together. We played on the same little league team and went to the same high school. Now, Clint lived about 30 miles out of town, on a piece of land his family had owned for generations. He called me, his voice shaking, telling me his truck had broken down in the middle of nowhere and he needed help. Tom, I swear, this ain't just a regular breakdown. There's something else out here. Can you come get me? Clint's voice was cracking, and I could hear the fear in it. Clint wasn't one to get spooked easily, so his panic put me on edge. I grabbed my toolbox, jumped into my old Ford, and headed out. The drive was long and dark, the kind of dark where you can't see your hand in front of your face. No streetlights, just the moonlight, and the occasional glow of my headlights reflecting off road signs. When I reached Clint, 
His truck was on the side of a dirt road, steam hissing from under the hood. He was standing there, flashlight in hand, looking around like he expected something to jump out at him. Clint, what the hell's going on? I asked, hopping out of my truck. Tom, there's something out there, he said, pointing towards the dense woods that lined the road. I heard noises, saw something moving. It ain't no animal I ever seen. I popped the hood of his truck and started looking around. The radiator hose was busted, easy enough to fix. As I worked, Clint kept looking over his shoulder, jumping at every little sound. Calm down, man. It's probably just a coyote or something, I said, trying to keep my own nerves steady. No, Tom, this ain't no coyote. It was standing on two legs, tall, with these glowing eyes. I swear it looked right at me. I finished fixing his truck, but the whole time, I felt like we were being watched. I tried to brush it off, but Clint's fear was contagious. We got his truck running, and he followed me back to town. I figured that was the end of it. Clint just got spooked by something, and we'd laugh about it over a few beers later. A few days passed, and Clint was still on edge. He'd barely sleep, kept talking about the creature he saw. I didn't believe him, but I didn't want to call him crazy, either. Then, one night, I was working late at the shop. It was around midnight, and I was just finishing up when I heard a noise outside. It was a low, rustling sound, like something was moving through the junkyard behind the shop. I grabbed a flashlight and went to check it out. The night was still, the kind of stillness that presses on your ears. I walked through the rows of rusted cars and scrap metal, my flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. Then I saw it. At first, I thought it was a person, but it was too tall, too thin. It stood on two legs, but its limbs were long and gangly, like something that had been stretched out. Its eyes reflected the light from my flashlight, glowing like a pair of headlights in the dark. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. It didn't move just stared at me with those eerie eyes. I don't know how long we stood there, but it felt like an eternity. Then it turned and slipped away into the shadows, moving with an unnatural grace. I ran back inside, locked the doors, and called Clint. He answered on the first ring. I saw it, Clint. I saw the thing you were talking about. From that night on, things got worse. People started disappearing. First, it was animals, pets mostly, but then it was folks from town. A couple of teenagers went missing, then old man Hargrove, who lived alone out by the edge of the woods. The sheriff organized search parties, but they never found anything. Just more questions and more fear. Clint and I started keeping watch at night, taking turns patrolling the edges of our properties. We armed ourselves with whatever we could find, Shotguns, hunting rifles, even a couple of old pistols. We weren't sure if they would do any good, but it made us feel a little safer. One night, while I was on watch, I heard the noise again. That same rustling sound. I crept out of my house, flashlight in one hand, shotgun in the other. The moon was full, casting an eerie light over everything. As I walked towards the sound, I saw it again. This time, it was closer. I could see more details. The pale, almost translucent skin, the long claw-like fingers. I raised my shotgun, but before I could fire, it was on me. It moved faster than anything I'd ever seen, knocking me to the ground. I felt a searing pain as its claws raked across my arm. I screamed and fired blindly, the shot echoing through the night. The creature recoiled, a high-pitched screech filling the air. Clint came running, his own gun drawn. He fired a couple of shots, and the creature fled, disappearing into the woods. I was bleeding pretty bad, and Clint helped me back to the house. We called the sheriff, but when he showed up, there was nothing to be found. Just a few drops of blood on the ground and my torn up arm. The attacks kept happening. More people went missing. The town was in a state of constant fear. Clint and I tried to figure out what the creature was, where it came from, but we had no answers. We started calling it the Wendigo, 
after an old Native American legend about a creature that could possess people and turn them into monsters. It was the only thing that made any sense. One night, we decided to go after it. We couldn't just sit around waiting to be picked off one by one. We gathered a group of guys from town, armed to the teeth, and headed into the woods. We followed the trails, the signs of disturbance. It was like tracking an animal, but we knew this thing was much worse. We found its lair deep in the woods, a cave hidden behind a tangle of bushes and trees. The smell hit us first, a mix of decay and something else, something metallic. We steeled ourselves and went in, flashlights cutting through the darkness. Inside, we found the remains of the missing people. It was a gruesome sight, bones scattered around, half-eaten bodies, the stench of death everywhere. In the center of the cave, we saw it, the creature. It was hunched over, gnawing on something. When it saw us, it let out a scream and charged. We opened fire, the cave lighting up with the muzzle flashes. The creature moved fast, too fast, darting around, dodging our shots. It took down a couple of guys before we managed to corner it. Clint fired a shot that hit it square in the chest, and it went down, screeching and writhing on the ground. We stood there, breathing hard, guns trained on the creature. It twitched a few times, then went still. We approached cautiously, ready to fire again if it moved. Clint and I exchanged a look, relief washing over us. We burned the creature's body, not wanting to take any chances. The attack stopped after that. The town slowly started to recover, but the scars remained. People were wary, cautious. We all knew what had happened, but we didn't talk about it much. The sheriff kept the official story vague. Animal attacks, maybe a bear. But we knew the truth. Clint and I stayed close, bonded by what we'd been through. We never figured out exactly what the creature was, where it came from, or why it had targeted our town. But we did know one thing. We had survived. And we'd do whatever it took to keep our town safe. Life eventually went back to some semblance of normalcy, but the memory of that summer stayed with us. Every time I heard a noise in the woods, Every time I walked home alone at night, I couldn't help but remember those glowing eyes and that screeching howl. We had faced something out of a nightmare and lived to tell the tale. And while the creature was gone, the fear it left behind lingered, a reminder of the darkness that could lie hidden just beyond the light. Even now, years later, I can't forget the terror we faced. It's a part of me, a part of this town, and though we've moved on, we remain vigilant always watching, always ready, because you never know when the darkness might return. My name is Nathaniel Redhawk, and this all went down in 1998. I was living in a small town in northern Arizona, a place so tucked away that most folks wouldn't even bother to find it on a map. My family had lived there for generations, and I was working as a guide, taking tourists out to see the sights and the beauty of the desert. Life was simple and quiet, just the way I liked it. One summer, I got a call from an old friend, Henry Two Feathers. He'd been living in Phoenix for a while but wanted to reconnect with his roots and asked if I'd take him out on one of my tours. He brought along his cousin Elias and a couple of friends from the city, Mac and Tom. We planned to spend a few days camping in the canyons, exploring some of the lesser-known trails and just catching up. We set off early one morning, the sun just beginning to rise over the red rocks. The first day was uneventful, good weather, plenty of laughs, and a few harmless scares from the local wildlife. It felt good to be out there with Henry again, sharing stories and enjoying the peace that only the desert can provide. The second night things started to get strange. We were sitting around the campfire, talking about everything and nothing when we heard a noise. It wasn't an animal. It was something else, a sort of rustling and then a faint, almost human-like cry. We all fell silent, listening, but it stopped as abruptly as it started. We shrugged it off, blaming it on the wind or maybe some distant coyote. Later that night, I woke up to the sound of footsteps outside my tent. They were slow, 
deliberate, and far too heavy to be any of the guys. I unzipped my tent just enough to peek out and saw nothing but darkness. I lay back down, my heart pounding, and tried to convince myself it was just my imagination. Eventually, I fell back asleep. The next morning, Elias mentioned he had heard the same thing. We laughed it off, but there was an unease in the air that hadn't been there before. We decided to move camp further into the canyon, hoping a change of scenery would put our minds at ease. As we hiked deeper, the terrain became more challenging. We reached a narrow pass that led to a secluded valley, a place I'd only been to a handful of times. It was beautiful, untouched, and felt like stepping back in time. We set up camp again and tried to shake off the previous night's weirdness. That evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, Henry and I took a walk around the perimeter of our camp. We talked about old times, and he mentioned how he'd been feeling disconnected lately, how the city life wasn't for him. I could relate. The desert had a way of grounding you, of making you feel small in the best possible way. As we headed back, we saw Mac and Tom standing by the fire, their faces pale. Mac pointed to the edge of the clearing where we had set up camp. There, half hidden in the shadows, was something. At first, it looked like a man, but as it moved into the light, we saw it was anything but. It was tall, unnaturally so, with long spindly limbs that seemed to move in jerky, unnatural ways. Its skin was pale and stretched tight over its bones, and its eyes were dark, empty pits. None of us moved, too stunned to react. It stood there for a moment, tilting its head as if studying us, then turned and disappeared into the darkness. We were all shaken, but no one wanted to admit just how scared we were. We didn't talk about it, didn't acknowledge what we'd seen. Instead, we went about our evening as if nothing had happened, though sleep didn't come easy that night. The following day, Tom was gone. We woke up to find his tent empty, his belongings scattered as if he had left in a hurry. Panic set in. We searched the area, calling his name, but there was no sign of him. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. Henry and I decided to split up to cover more ground. Mac and Elias stayed at camp in case Tom returned. I headed towards the pass we had come through, shouting Tom's name every few steps. The sun was high, and the heat was relentless. Hours passed with no sign of him. As I circled back towards camp, I found something on the ground. A scrap of Tom's shirt, torn and stained with blood. My heart sank. Whatever had taken him, it wasn't just an accident. When I got back to camp, the others were waiting. Henry looked at me with that same hopeless expression, and I showed them the scrap of fabric. We knew we had to get out of there and find help, but the way back was long, and the sun was already starting to set. We decided to leave at first light, thinking we'd be safer during the day. That night, none of us slept. We kept the fire burning bright and took turns keeping watch, though the darkness seemed to press in on us from all sides. The thing we'd seen, whatever it was, felt closer now, like it was watching, waiting. Sometime in the middle of the night, Mac, who was on watch, shook me awake. It's back, he whispered, his voice trembling. I scrambled out of my tent and saw it again, standing at the edge of the firelight. It was closer this time, its eyes reflecting the flames. It didn't move, just watched us with an intensity that made my skin crawl. Henry grabbed the rifle he had brought, aiming it at the creature. Get out of here, he shouted, his voice breaking the silence. The thing tilted its head again, almost as if it was curious, then turned and disappeared once more. The rest of the night passed in a tense, fearful silence. When dawn finally broke, we packed up quickly and started the long hike back to civilization. The journey was grueling, every sound and shadow making us jumpy. We were exhausted, physically and mentally, by the time we reached the nearest ranger station. We reported Tom missing and told them about the thing we'd seen, though we left out the more unbelievable details. The rangers organized a search party, but after days of looking, they found no trace of him. It was as if he had simply vanished. Back in town, things were never quite the same. 
Henry went back to Phoenix, but he was different. Quieter, more withdrawn. Mac and Elias stopped talking about the trip altogether, trying to forget the whole ordeal. As for me, I stayed in that small town, but I stopped taking people out to the canyons. The desert, once a place of peace and beauty, had become something else, something darker. Years went by, and I tried to move on. But every now and then, I'd think about that thing we saw, about Tom, and I'd wonder what really happened out there. I started doing some research, looking into local legends and old stories. I found references to a creature, something the old folks used to talk about. A skinwalker, they called it. A shapeshifter that could mimic human form. I can't say for sure if that's what we saw, but it made sense in a way. The stories talked about how it could lure people away, make them disappear. It was unsettling but it gave me some sort of explanation, something to hold on to. The years have passed, but the memory of that summer remains sharp, a constant reminder of the unknown lurking just beyond the edge of our understanding. I still live in that small town, still feel the pull of the desert, but I never venture too far from the familiar paths. The canyons hold their secrets, and I've learned to respect that. Some nights... When the wind is just right, I swear I can hear those footsteps again, slow and deliberate, echoing through the stillness. I stay inside, doors locked and try to forget, but it's always there at the edge of my mind, a reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. My name is Tohono Yazi and this happened to me back in 1993. I was living in a small town called Dry Ridge, Kentucky. Not the most exciting place on the map, but it was home. I worked at a local hardware store, the kind of place where everyone knew each other's name. My buddy Gabriel Bluefeather and I used to go hunting every weekend. Gabriel was a good man, always cracking jokes and making light of any situation. One Friday evening, Gabriel came by my place. We were gearing up for another hunting trip, this time to a place called Pine Hollow, a dense forest area about an hour's drive from town. We'd heard rumors about the place, something about people going missing, but we didn't pay much attention. You hear all sorts of stories growing up in a small town. We packed up our gear, grabbed some sandwiches, and loaded up my old pickup truck. Hey, Tohono, you think we'll actually see anything out there? Or is this just another one of your wild goose chases? Gabriel teased as he tossed his bag into the truck bed. Who knows, Gabe? Maybe we'll get lucky this time, I replied, chuckling. Besides, it's not like we've got anything better to do. The drive to Pine Hollow was uneventful, just the two of us talking about old times and the usual banter. By the time we arrived, the sun was starting to set. The forest had an eerie calm to it, but we brushed it off. We set up our camp near a small clearing, got a fire going, and settled in for the night. As the night wore on, Gabriel pulled out a flask from his bag. To good times and bad decisions, he said, raising it in a toast. We laughed and passed the flask back and forth, sharing stories until we were both feeling a bit tipsy. In the middle of the night, I woke up to a strange noise. It wasn't loud, but it was enough to jolt me awake. It sounded like someone was walking around our campsite. I shook Gabriel awake. Gabe, you hear that? He grumbled, still half asleep. What is it, man? Listen, I whispered. We both went silent, straining to hear. There it was again, the sound of twigs snapping underfoot. Gabriel grabbed his flashlight and shone it around the campsite. Nothing, just darkness and the occasional rustling of leaves. Probably just a deer or something, he mumbled, lying back down. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. The next morning, we woke up to find our campsite a mess. Our food supplies were scattered, and there were strange tracks in the dirt. They looked like human footprints, but distorted, almost as if whoever made them had an extra toe or something. 
Gabriel laughed it off. Maybe Bigfoot paid us a visit, he joked. We decided to press on with our hunting trip, but I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that had settled in my gut. As we moved deeper into the forest, the air grew thick and oppressive. It was as if the trees themselves were closing in on us. Around midday, we stumbled upon an old cabin. It looked abandoned, but curiosity got the better of us. We decided to take a look inside. The door creaked open, and a musty smell hit us. The place was in shambles, with broken furniture and debris scattered everywhere. But what caught our attention was a series of strange symbols carved into the walls. They looked like some kind of ancient writing, something I'd never seen before. Creepy, Gabriel muttered. Think we should head back? Yeah, maybe this place isn't as empty as we thought, I replied, feeling a chill run down my spine. As we turned to leave, we heard a loud crash from deeper within the cabin. Gabriel and I froze, our eyes locked on each other. Did you hear that? He whispered. Yeah, I replied, my heart pounding. We should go. We hurried out of the cabin and back to our campsite. The rest of the day passed without incident, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. That night we decided to keep a watch, taking turns while the other slept. It was Gabriel's turn first, and I drifted off to an uneasy sleep. I woke up to Gabriel shaking me awake, panic in his eyes. Tohono, wake up! There's something out there! I grabbed my flashlight and my rifle, my heart racing. We both stood at the edge of the campsite, listening. The forest was deathly silent, not even the sound of insects. Then, we saw it. A figure standing at the edge of the clearing, just beyond the reach of our flashlight beams. It was tall, humanoid, but its limbs were too long, its movements too jerky. Its eyes seemed to glow in the dark. What the hell is that? Gabriel whispered, his voice trembling. I don't know, but we need to get out of here, I replied, backing away slowly. The figure took a step forward, and we both bolted for the truck. We could hear it crashing through the underbrush behind us, moving faster than any human could. We jumped into the truck, and I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking. Go! Go! Gabriel shouted. The engine roared to life, and I floored it, tearing down the rough forest path. We didn't stop until we were miles away from Pine Hollow, the sun starting to rise behind us. We never spoke about what happened that night, not to anyone. Gabriel and I drifted apart after that. He moved to another town, and I stayed in Dry Ridge. But I never went back to Pine Hollow. Years later, I still think about that night. I've heard stories, whispers about a creature that roams the forests, taking those who wander too far. Some say it's an ancient spirit, others call it a demon. I don't know what it was, but I know it was real. And I know I'll never forget the terror of that night in Pine Hollow. Since then, I've tried to live a normal life. I got married, had kids, and settled down. But every so often, I wake up in the middle of the night, my heart racing, and I swear I can hear the sound of twigs snapping outside my window. I know it's probably just my mind playing tricks on me, but I can't help but feel that whatever it was out there, it's still watching, waiting. I've done some research over the years, trying to find any explanation for what we saw. I've come across stories of similar encounters, descriptions that match what we saw almost perfectly. The creature, whatever it is, seems to be part of some old Native American folklore, a guardian of the forest, or perhaps something more sinister. They call it the Wendigo. It's strange, but knowing that there are others who've seen it too doesn't bring much comfort. If anything, it makes it worse. It means it's not just a figment of my imagination. It's something real, something out there. I've warned my kids about going too deep into the woods. They think I'm just being an overprotective dad, but I can't take any chances. I've also kept in touch with Gabriel, though we don't talk about that night. He's got a family of his own now, and I think he's tried to move on, just like me. But I know he hasn't forgotten either. Last year, there was a news story about a group of hikers who went missing in Pine Hollow. 
The authorities chalked it up to them getting lost. But I know better. I tried to warn them, but no one listens to old stories. Not until it's too late. I still go hunting, but never alone, and never in places I don't know. There's a comfort in familiarity, in knowing the lay of the land. I stick to the same areas now, places where I know there's no chance of running into anything. Unnatural. People often ask me why I still hunt, given what happened. It's hard to explain, but there's a peace to be found in the wilderness, a connection to something greater than ourselves. Even after everything, I can't give that up. Maybe it's my way of taking back control, of facing my fears head on. One day, I might tell my kids the full story, not just the warnings. They deserve to know, to understand why their old man is so cautious. But for now, I'll keep it to myself, another ghost story in a town full of them. Life goes on, and I try to focus on the good. But every now and then, I'll catch a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye, or hear a noise that doesn't quite fit. And I'll remember that night in Pine Hollow, and the creature that still haunts my dreams. Maybe one day, someone will figure out what it is, find a way to stop it. But until then, all I can do is stay vigilant and hope that it never comes back. That's all any of us can do, really. It's a strange world we live in, full of mysteries and dangers. Some of them we can explain, and others, well, they remain in the shadows, just out of reach.